So we have a few lightning talks for you. We have uh, one very exciting uh, ending, hopefully very vociferous. Uh, they'll, they'll come along in a little bit. Um, I'm pretty excited about lightning talks because I love seeing things that are dazzling and brilliant and over in a flash. I can't usually do the first, so I can try and do the last two and be brief. And I'll do that now and introduce our first speaker who also is helping coordinate uh, the lightning talks. So if Hackman wants to come on up, and give us uh, a talk about identifying phishing domains. Please give him a warm round of applause as our first speaker. Okay, so uh, I'm chief system architect of SiteGround, and we host a lot of shit. So, uh, millions of hosts, and sometimes of some of those hosts uh, get compromised, uh, not because of us, but uh, the users have malware on their computers, uh, they uh, don't update their websites and stuff like this. So, uh, on local machines, we cannot help but uh, uh, lead. Where are the slides? So uh, on local machines, we cannot help. But on our servers, we can actually uh, check what's going on. And since we have a lot of sites uh, that we are hosting, we get a lot of complaints for hosting phishing, which I really don't like at all. Uh, usually, this is handled by our abuse department, but uh, it's manual work every time. So uh, I decided to use a little bit of uh, AI to help the, uh, these guys and actually uh, stop them uh, doing any phishing. So uh, usually we have also complaints for spam, uh, for botnets, but uh, those we have uh, fixed in the past, so we don't have issues with that. Check. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, when you turn it off, it disconnects here. Yeah. No. Okay. You didn't miss anything from the slides, don't worry. Uh, the important stuff is uh, now. So, uh, phishing is a bit problematic because uh, you actually don't know uh, that you're hosting this and actually uh, you don't know when it happened. Uh, and uh, usually it's uh, not directly from the user but from someone that is impersonating the user or uploading via application that we don't know that can upload something. Uh, usually the attackers upload uh, the phishing page and leave it there or uh, create a separate host only for uh, this page or even sometimes order a uh, specific domain name only for uh, this phishing site. So uh, for the last two, uh, we have already uh, deployed something on our infrastructure that uh, we can automate this. Uh, when they're creating a host name that uh, should enter uh, the web server configuration, we actually put it through our AI and it checks if this uh, host uh, actually looks like a phishing. Can I explain why, uh, how? So uh, we decided to use a little bit of AI, only a little bit. Uh, but first, before we start with AI, uh, what we uh, found is that uh, a lot of uh, domains and hosts that have Amazon, Hotmail, eBay, and stuff like this, words that are obviously not hosted on our infrastructure, uh, shouldn't be there. Unfortunately, there is a problem if you start uh, with uh, the words approach, because uh, there, there are things like the fruit bank. Uh, eBay checkout, uh, Amazon checkout, and stuff like this that are uh, normal for web developers to create subdomains uh, and use those for their uh, sh shopping carts. So these are valid things. While uh, Amazon.co.uk.something.something obviously is uh, something that is a phishing. So uh, we decided to uh, start with uh, word 2 vec uh, word 2 vec is uh, representing uh, uh, like a sentence, uh, creating uh, a number from each word and creating a vector from uh, these words. So we can actually uh, check if this domain is similar to uh, something that we consider bad. Unfortunately, uh, we were not very successful with that. Uh, it was only 60, uh, 60 to 76 uh, 
uh, percent accuracy. So we decided to switch to something else. And uh, to improve that, uh, we decided to look a little bit more on uh, the phishing hosts that uh, are created. Usually uh, stuff like Amazon, where the O is rep represented by zero. Uh, and some uh, misspellings uh, here. Uh, a lot of uh, dashes or uh, underscores uh, used, and uh, verification that this host actually has a uh, web-facing uh, interface, because a lot of the underscores are used in DNS uh, legally, but uh, in the web, usually you don't see something with uh, underscore. Uh, so we switched from uh, word to vec to uh, sport vector machines, and uh, there we actually achieved 95 to 97% accuracy of uh, detecting a phishing host. So uh, what we did was uh, we started with n-grams, uh, two to four characters, uh, depending uh, on what your data set is. We actually had to tune this uh, like a week in order to make it work. Dictionaries with uh, bad and good words uh, that we really want to know that they're in uh, the domain, uh, the host name, and uh, other uh, checks like uh, how many dashes, how many underscores, how many numbers, and uh, how many, uh, how long is the host name, uh, actually helped a lot to uh, achieve this 95, 97% accuracy. So once we had this, uh, we actually uh, uh, filtered all of the hosts that we are hosting right now and found around 4,000 phishing pages on our uh, infrastructure and called the owners of the hosting accounts to remove those things. Uh, I'm planning to use the same infrastructure for uh, directories and files that are used for phishing. So, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so, we have another speaker coming up. While he's getting set up, I'm always curious to see how far people have come. Um, obviously, there are some people here from, from Holland. Yeah? Raise your hands. Good. Anyone from Eastern Europe? Excellent. Fantastic. Central Europe? Africa? South America? Okay. Interesting. Ah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. So who reckons they've come the farthest? Yeah? Where have you come from? San Francisco. All right. Anyone from further away than San Francisco? Pacific Islands, maybe? Yeah? What do we got? China. China. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, our next talk is about open hardware. And um, just go ahead. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Poltrak, and I would like to briefly talk to you about open hardware uh, reconfigurable network cameras built by hackers for hackers. So uh, I will not read the specs, but you can see that it's a quite powerful uh, Zinc CPU running Linux open embedded uh, Yocto build. Uh, and it has a lot of uh, extensions such as SATA, USB, Sync ports, etc. So you can uh, really run on port a lot of application to the camera, like uh, OpenCV was really easily portable to the camera, and you can adapt any hardware supported by Linux and connect it to the camera directly. Uh, this is the PCB design, and since it's open hardware, on our wiki you will find all the information about the PCB layouts, BOM, etc. Uh, you can also uh, virtually disassemble our um, assemblies, our camera assemblies. You can see any model in this kind of 3D, uh, X3 DOM models, and virtually disassemble them. If you click on the right on the parts, it will show the part uh, on the wiki with all the documentation. Uh, so the wiki address, the blog, you can subscribe to our blog to receive some information time to time. And on the licensing, uh, we uh, exclusively use free software licenses and CERN open hardware for uh, the hardware part. A um, few years ago, we started with uh, calibrated cameras. So we do sub-pixel uh, resolution calibration for uh, individual sensor, but also uh, for camera rigs containing multiple sensors. 
um, such as this one, for example. So you will find more, more information about the cameras on those, these two links. Uh, thanks. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, recently, we also started with uh, 3D printed cases so that you can experiment different sensor arrangement and do panoramic cameras or stereo, stereo photogrammic cameras or different multi-sensor camera arrangements. Uh, so why multi-sensors? Uh, the easy answer would be just because we can. We have enough power on the FPGA, on the camera, to process up to even uh, 12 sensors per uh, motherboard. You can connect up to four sensors directly to the camera or 12 with a multiplexer uh, board. And uh, we can have many fancy applications of multi-sensor multi with calibrated uh, cameras. So this is an example of uh, panoramic cameras. Elf will build um, uh, the Street View cameras that was used for Google Street View. And then we have built this new camera for uh, stereo, uh, stereo photogrammic uh, panoramas. So this ca camera is capable of uh, 3D reconstruction. Uh, this is another uh, example of 3D reconstruction with a four lens camera doing a single shot uh, 3D reconstruction. And the software is currently available already uh, in Imagey. And now we are starting to port in it to the FPGA. So it will run real time in, inside the camera itself. And this is another example of uh, multi-sensor camera application. Uh, it's a free lens camera, but you can also do this with the 21 lens I showed before. Uh, and it provides you a dynamic depth of field uh, in post-processing. So you can uh, choose the depth of field of your camera and uh, make uh, all the rest um, uh, blurry. Uh, so uh, we also provide cameras for developers. You can apply for uh, sponsored cameras. You can contact me for this. Uh, during SHA, I'm present at the Open Digital Radio and Z-Wave uh, village. You can find me there and test the camera if you are interested to do so. Thank you very much. Perfect. Fantastic. Off to a great start. Outdoor living. A bit of fishing, some uh, camera work, uh, outdoor cameras in particular. And uh, our next speaker is continuing with the theme of outdoor living. Uh, PC Wiz here is going to talk to us about the pirate life, which I think uh, epitomizes uh, outdoor living. So uh, once you're set up, I'll uh, stop making up this rubbish, trying to tie together this disparate Muppet show of, uh, of themes. Instead, we'll just enjoy the presentations. Um, yeah. Good? Looking good. We've got a mouse. That's outdoor living. Too, right? Okay, cool. Pirates in practice. So here's a talk uh, from PC Wiz about uh, pirate life. Yo, this isn't going to be a technical talk. Oh, I've got transitions and everything. Oh well. Um, I copied that from a presentation I made clearly. So that's my details, and it's changing automatically. Stop, stop. Oh, oh well. It's going through the slides. So um, here's basically the. Um, I'm going to talk about, I ran in the general election in the UK um, that just happened, which was fun, and I learned some things. So I'm going to share some of those. Um, the first thing I'm going to um, kind of go through is the story um, of why I ran in the general election. And that was basically um, because I made a kind of joke at a pub a couple of years earlier um, with my friends sitting around the table feeling a bit sad um, about the tyranny of the current government and going, you know what, if it's another general election, I'll run uh, for the Pirate Party. And um, lo and behold, after weeks of saying there will not be a general election, there was a general election. So I, um, that's why I ran. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so basically, the, the process is, because the UK Pirate Party is quite small, um, it was basically just send an email to a nominations officer, a couple of 
um, days later, um, you're a candidate. Okay, um, having not really been involved with the Pirate Party that much before, I'd been a member for a while, but not really participating in anything, I had no idea where to go. So the first thing I did was go onto the Discord server because I had been avoiding Discord because I don't like it, but apparently we use it. And there was lots of friendly people there to help me do election things. So, yay. And there is plenty of election paperwork to do, which is um, also fun. Um, <laughs> and has to be done on time, but it's really not that hard. Um, so kind of um, the, the thing I want to really pass on to people is that it's all about confidence and about just being able to force yourself to go and do something. Um, talking to the press is about nagging the press. Um, they don't come to you, they're not interested, they're lazy. They don't even spell check the things you send them. So the most important thing to do is use all of the spell checking and grammar checking um, people you can um, to, when you're dealing with the press. Um, that's, that's the top tip. And the, sec the second tip is to put yourself in situations where you can't really do anything other than continue in the situation. Because that way, you're not going to wuss out and go, oh, I'm, I'm not doing this, I'm just going to hide away in the corner and not cause a fuss. Um, you, you just have to get on and do it. And that's, and that's basically how my campaign worked. Um, and I guess the last thing, well, one of the things to touch on um, with with the whole election thing, is that obviously I wasn't going to win a seat in the UK Parliament. That just simply wasn't going to happen. I wasn't even going to get a large number of votes in the UK Parliament. So when you're running for a small party in the UK, you've got to measure success differently. So the way I was measuring success was by engagement and causing conversation in the local area where I was running, and that happened. So that's what I call success. Um, I've got about two minutes left, so <laughs> I shall import some more knowledge on you. Um, so one other thing I learned is that pirate policies can be applied to areas that aren't just about copyright and um, software patents and the digital world. Um, you have to try and find a way of applying those to everyday issues like school funding or um, health care provision. And the way to do that is to go and actually talk to people. So you have to turn up at school halls and things, which the lead candidate didn't actually do, but oh well. Um, so, um, so you have to turn up and talk to people. And that's basically um, the point and getting the exposure. And I think I've run out of stuff, so I'll hand it back over. Fantastic. Thank you. I have to admit that largely describes my life as well, turn up and talk to people. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's endless. This is Genesis RE, he was here yesterday. He came to speak to us about uh, the history of legal cannabis and running cannabis farms. Uh, today he's going to speak to us about something else, I have no idea what it'll be. Uh, mushrooms, you think? Oh, it could be. Um, I don't think so. I've seen him speak about a lot of uh, other outdoor things. He was going to speak to us about uh, hacker yoga. I don't know how hacker yoga works. I guess that's some sort of uh, stretching exercise where you reach out and grab shells uh, in the morning, praying to the shell gods. Um, but that was the previous talk. What's the new talk? Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's coming. There you go. Two years ago. Uh, two years ago, I had uh, three uh, lightning talks uh, back to back. Uh, right now, I just have uh, five minutes. I would like to have some assistance with the slides. Can you move it to the uh, correct screen? I'm not... Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Take your time. We won't start yet. Let's get the, let's and, get the slides uh, today, up. Today, I didn't get any sleep. I was, I was presenting at an online uh, summit community, and I was presenting for an, for an hour. And then I had another hour, very powerful conversation. So my energy was just so high and I was so motivated. I couldn't fall asleep. Right now I had a two hours nap and my body is fully recharged. Yeah, I yeah. treat my body as the technology. I treat my brain as technology. And I've purchased this domain, hackeryoga.com, two years ago at the Chaos uh, Communication Camp. So these are my different uh, yoga uh, postures. Uh, it's, it helps. It helps me with different uh, back pains and, and other, 
you know, occupational hazards. Uh, but uh, today, the main subject of the talk is actually another project I'm making, which is called Astral Ship Genesis. And previously, it took me an hour to go through this slide, so right now I'll just give you a very, very quick overview. This is my bio. Don't read it. I will send you the link to slides. This is me and uh, my evolution throughout the years. I called myself a shapeshifter, alchemist, uh, wizard, magician. I am yet to explore my true calling on this planet. Uh, I am originally from Poland. That's where my accent is coming from. In Poland, communism times, lines to get any food, no, nothing in the shops. Uh, communism was not cool. Uh, I was to Burning Man, I was to Rainbow Gathering, I was to Boom Festival, I was to many intentional communities. This is my profile on Stack Overflow. I was working for a bank for a very good money. Now I am no longer employed by a bank, which is a very relief. These are my two kids. I love them so much. They are very cosmic. They know everything. Uh, this is my little yoga website that helps me with the back pain. And when, when, you, when you are a good-looking man and you go to a yoga class full, full of girls, it's just incredible. It is completely out of the world how many girls I meet through yoga. This is ridiculous. Yoga needs more men. And uh, hacker festivals need more women. Uh, the gender is rather imbalanced. So we actually have this chapel. We have this large building. The amount of work that is put here is completely ridiculous. It is out of this planet. But we have a building in North Wales. It is when you fly, fly to Liverpool or Manchester because it's much, much easier. Liverpool and Manchester fly to Manchester or Liverpool. This is the uh, Google Earth. This is the Street View. This is the, our building. This is our Instagram profile. We actually have the building. And we have a, a video, uh, links, links, resources, blah, blah, everything. Uh, go visit our wiki. And you know what? Now we are flying to Mars. Elon Musk is flying to Mars. The, in the popular culture, it is uh, normal. We are flying to Mars. It is done. It is happening. We are also traveling through time, through gravity waves. Uh, the concept of virtual reality, consciousness, it is happening. Like We are already approaching singularity. And Elon Musk, what is the chance we live in the base reality? Of course we live in a simulation, one in a billion chance. So in the 10 years, Facebook, iPhone, blockchain, all these technologies are so revolutionizing the world. We have everything to live prosperous life. We do not have to work. Majority of the work is bullshit, middle management, pushing papers. We do not have to work. Universal basic income is getting introduced on a global scale. And... Uh, I'm just jumping, jumping, jumping. Yesterday it was an hour. I just want to go to this, you know, clue, essence. These guys are buying city for 50,000 uh, pounds. These guys are doing a hack base on the desert. These guys are all opening a new country. This country has been in route for like 50 years. We are opening a new country. We will send an official invitation to every single country on the planet. Hey, we are recognizing you as a country. Please allow us to open official embassy at your land. And we will also send the invitation to, to countries like Google. Google is already more powerful than many islands on Pacific. We will recognize Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft as the actual countries because they have a much bigger influence than all these you know, three islands on the Pacific. So this is happening. And I am inviting you to our project. We are building $1,000 life support capsule food, water, oxygen, waste treatment, energy, because you can look at the human body consists of cells, and planet Earth consists of humans. We treat one human as a cell of humanity, and as we, as we will travel throughout outer space, as humanity will expand to other planets, which is already happening. The Mars, the Elon Musk, the SpaceX, it is already happening, and we believe that by solving this problem, how to sustain life, uh, we will solve many other interesting problems. And uh, I invite you to the party. Once you see, you can and see. I thank you so much for staying with me. Mm. I love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, too many hyperlinks. That's fantastic. Don't forget your laptop. Don't forget your laptop. This is yours? Oh, okay, all right, very well. Um,
So uh, that's like compressing ideas and audio on the fly. I feel like I just went through 3,000 hyperlinks and too many ideas to compress into a single five-minute space-time continuum. Um, but our next talk is going to be about open digital uh, radio. Uh, Matthias has just signed up to do a lightning talk. Are there anybody else? Is there anyone else in here who would like to do lightning talks? We have a lot of space tomorrow. We probably have 18 slots for lightning talks. So uh, sign up for a lightning talk. Bring your friends. Um, I see some of my friends in the back of the room. They don't want to be associated with me, which is why they sit all the way at the back with my agent. And I know that they promised to come and speak tomorrow, too. So you better be signing up. All right. Anybody do the uh, public speaking technology, public speaking workshop the other day? Yes? And have you done a lightning talk? What, what is your excuse for that? <laughs> Please join us. We need more lightning talks tomorrow. So I'm going to leave uh, Matthias with the stage to do uh, open digital radio. Thank you very much. After this uh, presentation, talking about all these things we'll have in the far future, I'm going to talk to you about a radio broadcasting standard from the early 90s. And uh, more uh, concretely, more concrete, the Open Digital Radio Association uh, maintains and develops a uh, piece of software that can be used to set up a uh, fully open source digital audio broadcasting transmission chain. So in a few words, digital audio broadcasting is a European standard, uh, as said from the, from the early 90s, that is to radio what DVB-T is to television. So it's the step from analog modulation, analog transmission of radio broadcasts to a digital transmission of, uh, of this content. This has a benefits in terms of audio quality, in terms of a number of programs you can transmit in a, in a given region, and has all, all sorts of advantages because it's a digital, a digital medium. Uh, so our tools that allow everybody to, to generate these signals uh, are comprised of an audio encoder so that you can prepare the, the content, you can encode the content properly, there is a multiplexer that can gather many different sources together. And there is a piece called the modulator that can create the, the signal that you really have to transmit then over an antenna to reach your audience. And we're using generic devices. These devices from a company called Etus, but it also works with your badge from the last CCC camp or equivalently with the HackerF uh, and other software-defined radio devices like these. So the tools themselves, they're not a, a full solution. It's not just something you can buy. It's not a box you buy and then you set up somewhere on your transmission site and it works. But it's a set of tools you can assemble. You, it's flexible. It's interconnected using IP. So you can create your own, uh, your own system. And all of this is on our website, omdigitalradio.org. And also, on all the sources are on GitHub, and it's GPL licensed. In addition to these uh, tools necessary for the broadcast themselves, we also have additional things around. There's a lot of uh, effort also active in uh, the reception part, because, of course, you need to be able to receive this uh, DAB signal. And you can use the RTL SDR sticks, these very cheap SDR dongles, or other SDR devices to receive your signal and listen to, to radio. This thing is in use in several countries in 24-7 broadcasts in Europe, uh, among them Switzerland, the United Kingdom. There's uh, somebody in Denmark who operates a, uh, a transmitter using these tools. And there's also somebody in, in Germany that I've learned this very recently, a first test transmission that, is, uh, that has started. What are we doing more or less currently? So, I mean, what are we doing at the camp? We have a small village. Uh, we have uh, uh, an ongoing project. The goal is to make power amplifiers more energy efficient, or the goal is to use more of the potential of a given power amplifier and make it more efficient in terms of electricity usage. So here you see a small setup. The most important thing in the picture is, of course, the, the mate bottle. We are uh, looking for codec experts who could help us improve the audio quality of the encoder. So if anybody is or wants to become an expert in audio coding, you're welcome to get in touch with us. And there's also activity regarding monitoring tools and all the things you need if you operate these tools in a, 
in a production broadcast. So to conclude, we have a village. Uh, I hope you can see the arrow. So we're in the northwest of the, of the Lamar field. It's just over there, uh, near, the, near the large tower. We're sharing our tent with the Zigbee, uh, the, the Z-Wave crowd, the Z-Wave crowd. And to conclude, many thanks to everybody who's involved in this camp, organizing it and helping out. Many thanks. Microphone? There we go. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, Peter is our next speaker. Um, he just rocked up earlier. Uh, I'm getting the impression that he may or may not have slides or diagrams, but he looks like a professional. <laughs> Thank you so much. There you go. So, Enjoy. So my name is Peter van Eyck, and I would like to talk to you about cloud security. So who has never heard about cloud? You're a cheat. Right. So, I assume that you are, no, no, sorry. this talk is, this, this presentation is for people who are um, in some way, shape or form involved into like deploying online services. So who's deploying online services? Here, a fair amount. Who is using online services? That's the rest of you, right? <laughs> There's still a few people in the black box. Any of you who are really involved in securing online services? Okay, fair amount. So I'm going to give you a couple of resources to help you out on that. To start with, I think that it's my, it's my personal opinion that cloud is not so much a technology. Although it's technology driven, it's basically a new way of delivering IT. It's a supply chain of IT thinking. And I have a larger YouTube movie on that that explains it in a bit more detail. All those links will be on the uh, wiki uh, that comes with the lightning talk. So I'm write that up after, just, uh, after I've finished. So that's uh, the first thing to understand. And it's, it is unavoidable in a way. And if you want to talk about how unavoidable it is, meet me at the bar later. Right now, I want to give you some resources that, that are, um, let's say, really helpful in your work, potentially. Who's ever heard of the Cloud Security Alliance? Okay, a few people in the back. Great. So I'm, uh, I, I'm pretty much involved in the Cloud Security Alliance. I'm actually a board member of the Dutch chapter. Uh, and Cloud Security Alliance is doing a lot of great work. So this is a, like a non-profit organization supported by basically all large uh, relevant companies, 100,000 individual members doing summits and events across the world, but most importantly, producing a lot of free content, freely accessible content. And the flagship piece of content just got updated, and that's the uh, security guidance for uh, cloud computing. Um, that is just in its fourth uh, edition. It was uh, released one or two weeks ago. That's a body of knowledge that explains how to secure cloud computing. It has a lot of technical stuff, but it also has a lot of governance stuff. Now, you may or may not like that, but that's just a new reality, and this is one way of catching up on that. That body of knowledge is actually testable with an individual certification. Full disclosure, I do a course on that. Uh, but you can study for that yourself. Based on that same body of knowledge, there's also something that's called the cloud controls metrics. So if you're involved in securing cloud services, that's a really helpful uh, tool. Beyond that, if you're actually delivering an online service, you may want to look into the, uh, the STAR certification scheme, that is for a security trust assurance registry, which is also a product of the um, Cloud Security Alliance. And it's also freely available, no big bucks involved. Then what else was there in terms of important resources that I wanted to give you? So beyond that, there are like a, another 160 research products uh, ranging from big data security, IoT security, crypto, um, sa quantum safe crypto, uh, and, and a ton more that I won't go into right now. My call to action to you is have a look at that material. It's really uh, worthwhile doing that. Uh, you may want to consider going to an event, um, or we, we do some events in the Netherlands, I think in the UK is an event, Germany not so sure, the US a lot. Uh, I also run a cloud and container security meetup in the Netherlands, so you may want to be um, visiting that as well. And uh, basically, that's my message. You know, there's this stuff that you can use, come to the events, and if you want to talk there, that's even more fun. Um, Come over. Uh, we'll, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll actually coach you into giving a good presentation if you want to. 
So with that said, I have one minute left, but I'll, give it, I'll hand it back to you <laughs> um, to think it is over. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you see that? He stood right at the front of the stage, very professional, very projecting. That was pretty awesome. Um, we have another speaker who hopefully will come up to the stage. She's just turned up, so uh, it might be a bit of a surprise that she was coming up right at this moment. She's going to speak to us about fashion technology, and I think that's pretty cool. I bought a jacket a few years ago from a company uh, called Beta Brand, and it basically is called the Flash Bomber Hoodie. And if someone takes a picture of you at nighttime and the hood is up, it reflects the flash camera with tiny beads of, uh, of glass, and therefore your face is blacked out, so people can't take pictures of you. So I think fashion technology is super cool, and I'm glad that you're going to speak to us about it. So, Hi, everyone. So my name is Anina, and I have a startup company called 360 Fashion Network. And I've been doing fashion technology for the last 10 years. And as uh, technology has evolved, I have always taken it and applied it to the fashion industry. Fashion is often separated from the technology side because they are more hands-on. And also because of the technical nature, they often don't understand what's actually possible. On the engineering side, most engineers could care less really about elegance and style when they're coding and soldering and putting together a prototype. But I think we really need to merge these two worlds together. And I'll tell you why. Yesterday, a gentleman gave gave a speech where I asked him as far as tracking cameras, if there were any technologies available that would uh, enable me to scramble the cameras that I could embed in my clothing, for example. And he said, yeah, there's some like high powered infrared lights that, you know, I've seen that confuse the camera, but, you know, that's not a long term solution, he said, because only a few people would would actually be able to wear those. And he said, legislation is really the long-term uh, solution. And I said, yeah, but by the time legislation goes around, we're all tracked because, you know, the cameras are everywhere. But fashion, on the other hand, is actually a very fast way to react to technology. And I'll tell you why. Because when something is in fashion, it's in everything. When polka dots are in, they're in your curtains, they're in your shoes, they're in your clothes, they're in your laptop case, they're in your bag, they're in your car, they're in everything. The way the fashion industry works down is that as a trend emerges, it goes throughout the entire lifestyle of the human being. So in, in effect, I do believe that if there was a cap with high-powered LED, um, uh, infrared LEDs on it, and it was communicated properly to people, then all of a sudden, boom, very quickly, uh, you could roll out clothing with those LEDs inside, and people would understand them, and they would purchase them. And in a matter of a week or two, everyone could have this clothing, which would confuse the cameras. And another thing is, is that in the engineering environment, when I'm working together with large-scale companies, they come to me and they're like, we need to do something for women, or we need to do something with fashion, and we don't know what to do. And a lot of times that's because, I don't know, engineers think we're all naked, but I don't see nobody with like all their parts hanging out in this room. So they often forget that clothing, textiles, and accessories that what we are wearing are actually part of the IoT environment. I built 162 gloves that were all controlled using the gestures of the dancers, which controlled the entire lighting of the performance. And it was on CCTV. And the director, Jiang Gang, he absolutely refused to let me use any high-tech solutions. He wanted a button. So, I put a button on there. But you know what happens? The humans, they go, ooh, a button. I want to touch it. And then backstage, two minutes before your performance, you've got 50 girls running up to you going, my glove doesn't work, right? So disaster scenario. And you're like, did you push the button? And they're like, oh, yeah, I did, you know? So instead, what I did is I soldered off all the fucking buttons. And I was like, fuck that. That didn't work. And I used gesture recognition. 
Because in the performance, I watched that every time they wanted the lighting to go off, synchronized, they all made this one gesture. So that's a situation where a high-tech solution actually could solve elegantly a solution for the performance. And so I think that we really need to start thinking more of the lifestyle. So me and my company, I'm like often trying to bridge this divide between the two sides, excuse me, it's two sides, because they don't even speak the same language. So you have to work with the clothing people on the garment construction side and be like, I need channels coming out here. I need a zipper here. I need to be remove an inner layer here because if that's all not working, I need access to it for the engineers to fix it. On the engineering side, you have to think about the size and the flexibility. So all in all, I'd like to say that I think these two worlds need to come together and I'm seeing that over at our tent at the hacking space, if you want to come at 11. I've got engineers showing up and pimping up their style, and also lots of women. Thank you. Fantastic. Excellent. I like that idea. I have to admit, I think uh, hackers could be the cutting edge of fashion, the bleeding edge of fashion, right? Geek chic, baby. Um, I'd like to see more of that. So I was told earlier that I shouldn't stand uh, in between the camera and the pole, otherwise it sort of looks like I'm pole dancing, and nobody wants to see that, right? Um, wow, saucy crowd, saucy crowd. But uh, I don't want to get in the way of the next presentation, which is uh, deeply, deeply exciting. We try and save some really amazing things for the end. So we've got a bunch of people that I think are ready to come up here and maybe do a sound check before they do our final talk for the day. Come on up. Um, yeah, so you thought you'd seen it all, but now it really begins. And while they get set up, I'll keep things going a little bit. Can we have a round of applause for all the angels who've been helping out with the sound, helping out with the event? Yeah. Cool. Does anybody here know what this is going to be? Are you ready? Do you know what's coming? Do you know what this is? Can you guess? It's a choir. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited about this. Should I say something? It's up to you. Yeah, are you all set? All right. Just a moment. The microphone's coming on. All right. We just thanked them. They were busy bowing, so they didn't notice for a minute. Hello. OK, so, so this all started with that at the last uh, Chaos Communication Congress, I noticed that people always met at the table of the Free Software Foundation Europe to sing the Free Software song. And I thought I'll make a choir arrangement. And, and so now you can hear the choir. <laughs> can you get them?
Fantastic. <laughs> it's always worth staying till the end. I'm really pleased that... Um, Benjamin. Th ah, Benjamin. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Um, thanks again to the choir for coming up to sing that song. It was filled with a little bit of mild peril there at the end, reaching down into the toes. I think that was a reference to, to something. Um, anyways. I'm going to wrap it up now. I'm going to repeat a few things. Uh, once again, thanks to the angels and the sound people. Uh, give them another round of applause for the entire conference. <laughs> and I'm certainly pleased as well that when the lightning talk started, there were less of you in the room and more came in. I like to pretend that's uh, just me. I know it's not. I think it's all the fantastic speakers that we just had. So um, thanks for listening to all of them. And make sure you go and get your t-shirts from the online website or go and visit the shop because we're running out of them, but they will ship to Benelux in Germany. And enjoy the rest of the conference. We need more Lightning Talk speakers tomorrow. So sign up and come back and see us tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>